Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so we are here today to discuss another paper. This is, let's talk about the paper soon after reading it. And the concept of it is that we are reading, we choose a paper that we find interesting and we read it within less than two hours. And right after we meet up in this meeting and discuss it. And first, let us introduce ourselves. So, Yota. Hi, uh, I'm Yota Kawashima. I'm doing research assistant at ATL in Japan and Monash University. Yes, thank you. And Ryoshi? Hi, I'm Ryoshi Watanabe, a PhD student at Kyoto University, Japan. Thank you. And I'm Aniko Kustor. I'm a PhD student at Monash University. And today I will summarize the paper that we have read. So uh, this paper titled, Do Animals Dream? Uh, it was written by uh, Malinowski, Scheel, and McCloskey. And it was published in Consciousness and Cognition uh, in 2021. So let me just get right into it. So this paper basically asks the question, do animals dream? And starts with discussing the obvious difficulties of, of uh, investigating this, uh, these, these inquiries, because most of what we know about dreaming comes from human research and uh, comes from verbal uh, dream reports. And of course, depending on which kind of uh, deficient definition of consciousness uh, you are using, you may be in, inclined to say that it is only possible to do dream research on humans because they are the only ones who can actually talk about it. However, the authors argue that we actually have a couple of other strategies that we could potentially use to examine how sleep and how dreaming uh, is working in case of animals. So there are three, three main concepts that uh, we need to talk about uh, and what the authors kind of offer as an uh, alternative for these, um, for, or like some, some kind of complementary uh, thing that we can examine uh, next to verbal report in humans and uh, like in place of verbal reports in, in animals. So first there's uh, the dream enacting behaviors, then there's the neural correlates of dreaming, and finally there's the replay behavior or replay during dreaming. So what these three things are. Dream enacting behaviors are defined or, or they basically describe behaviors that seem to mimic what people are or animals seem to dream about. And there are multiple kind of many examples of this. Uh, a very obvious one is like when someone is dreaming about something um, kind of um, difficult or scary and then they wake up crying. Uh, or there are a lot of other examples of, you know, also physiological things like um, uh, having some kind of physio physiological reaction because you're dreaming about doing some sports or uh, changes in, yeah, like breathing patterns. And also there's, um, uh, the authors point out this very interesting uh, kind of disorder, which is the uh, REM sleep behavior disorder. And this in, in uh, people who, who have this kind of um, condition, they actually enact or, or they, they, they don't have the uh, typical uh, muscle uh, atonia during sleep and therefore they are actually kind of reenacting re or um, presenting the certain type of you know potentially aggressive movements like kicking or or punching and um, and so this is kind of sh shows that uh, this kind of physiological or and uh, bodily uh, representation or, or, or um, yeah, in, in, in enactment of, of uh, dreams seem to be uh, potentially a, a good marker uh, for, for the dream content. 
because it seems that um, uh, these kind of, some of the behaviors that are people presenting, so for example, punching and kicking, it is often related to uh, being under a threat uh, in the dream. So there seems to be some kind of relationship between the bodily um, kind of presentation and the dream content. Um, then we have the neural correlates of, of um, like dreaming. And this is, this is an area that has been uh, kind of evolving quite rapidly and there are very interesting findings, but it's also, there's a lot to, um, to know and, and there's a lot to research more. So it seems that there are some um, like general findings about um, the parietal uh, temporal occipital junction and also this uh, parietal hot zone. Uh, so it seems that these, um, or sorry, uh, posterior hot zone. And it seems that these regions, whenever there's um, an increased activity there, that seem to correlate with dreams and dream reports. Also, um, such results are decreased in slow wave activity and um, also activity in the front central region. So these are kind of these results illustrate that uh, it might be possible to look at also the neuro these kind of neural correlates and examine them in animals and try to see whether uh, they can kind of yeah they are they are also presenting themselves and they may be in line with. Uh, dreaming behaviors. And then finally, we have the replay, um, which is this concept of, or which is this phenomenon of whenever I, either in, it, so it is presented in animals, but also in humans. And basically, whenever you are learning something new, um, it seems that um, during sleep, these, uh, the, the neural patterns seem to be replayed. And this is kind of aiding or participating in memory consoli consolidation. And um, so it has been found in relation to motor learning, but also other type of learning in, in humans. And uh, it has been also established in uh, animal models such as rodents. And again, this is not necessarily, so replay, um, so this kind of replay-like activity, does not mean that the animals or the person have um, dreams about the con about these contents that that is being replayed. However, there are some studies or, and there are some indications that it it may be the case. Um, so again, this is we need to definitely be um, you know cautious in in interpreting replay like um, um, neural um, activity. Uh, as dream, but it might be something to, to actually look at and, and examine. And so finally, uh, one of the interesting, uh, oh yeah, so, so make, uh, another thing is that the authors point out the, uh, this kind of um, distinction between two sleep signatures, uh, which is the low activity and the high activity sleep. And it seems that in many animals, um, it seems to appear um, and it seems to be uh, quite interestingly presented that there is a, a type of sleep that is more active and um, it is also connected with, or uh, it is kind of appears as a more higher um, or higher arousal and also with high neural activity. Um, and on the other hand, there seem to be this low activity sleep uh, that is more presented with, with um, uh, kind of quieter um, kind of behavior and um, lower activity in the brain. And the authors point out that actually uh, the octopus seems to be a very interesting example who does presents these kind of behaviors, so these two types of sleep. Um, and perhaps because they are also seem to be able to uh, show changes during their sleep in, in their um, kind of uh, skin patterns. 
Uh, so they might be a, a useful example or, or a, a, a practical thing to uh, study um, because they seem to also reproduce potentially similar uh, bodily patterns during sleep as they do during uh, wakefulness. Um, and yeah, so the authors actually just suggest that, yeah, this is definitely, this would be a, an interesting avenue for future research. Mm, yeah, do you have anything to add to this summary? Okay. Okay, so if not, then uh, we can start the, the discussion or sorry, first we can also, if you have any questions about the paper. So I have one question. So this paper saying that non-human animal has an, an capacity or ability to have a dream based on behavior observation but it does not say that we can monitor online the dream online with these behavior observation right is my understanding correct i guess yeah um it depends on what do you mean exactly by monitoring uh but i think in general yeah like uh these behaviors may indicate dreaming but of course we don't know um know how precisely do they or how precisely can they do that i see so when i use the term monitoring i kind of imply that let's say for example um even if you observe the replay in the non-human animal brain it does not mean that the the animal always have a dream of that content right it's a kind of probabilistic. And at the same time, yeah. even if, you know, there are no replay kind of activity in the brain, the animals still can have a dream. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is where um, kind of, it's important to mention that uh, before we can really look or before it's kind of, reasonable for us to to assume these kind of um, isomorphisms as they as they use it in the paper um, I think we really need to make sure that we understand how it is working in humans and there's a lot to to kind of unpack and understand how for example this kind of um, replay process actually works in humans and although it seems there are some evidence showing that, um the the recall uh, or uh, this reenact or uh, sorry so the replay process actually may filter into dream contents but um i think there are very few studies for now so it is yeah there's a lot to that we don't know and we definitely need to establish that uh first and then we can actually we might be able to uh, look into animal models more easily. Well, at least that is my understanding. Okay, thank you. And um, I have last question, clarification question. So the reason why the authors uh, shows their interest of uh, octopus is that um, they did not show muscle par risk par uh, Atonia, so just the muscle can move or just active during REM sleep, but in non-human animals, basically uh, during uh, REM sleep, their muscle tend to be deactivated or dysfunctioned in a sense. So is it correct? Um, so I think, and this is something I, I was a bit un, unsure about, but I think um, what they say is because, um, yeah, it, it may be better to use um, 
octopus to this kind of research because uh, yeah, this kind of muscle activity is not kind of confounding things, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Maybe, uh, Ryoshi, did you understood that section? Yeah, but I think the author said um, also, yeah, um, all, um, almost animal have two stage three, but some animals have, uh, how to say, so mass, muscle, Brother, muscle have one stage is muscle relax, muscle relax, and one stage is not muscle relax, and the others have muscle relax or not muscle relax, relax in two stages. So I think, and all, 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 sorry, every, every animal don't have the have must relax with two stage. Sorry, right? Yeah, yeah, and I think they also mentioned that because um, so in most animals, in order to actually test this dream enactment behavior um, hypothesis, you need to do a lesion um, in sections of the brainstem or anyhow I don't want to uh, I, not, I don't necessarily know how in you know, which parts of the brain in, in animals do you need to do this kind of um, lesion but in order to because yeah so because this is something I, I, I failed to mention that um, this kind of um, REM sleep uh, behavior disorder can be replicated or can be kind of um, Yes, simulated in, in animals if you are doing a lesion, uh, like for example in rats. And um, in that way, then, and also I guess in cats as well. So uh, the fact that animals also seem to show kind of co fairly complex behaviors during their sleep um, uh, after, after the uh, lesion affecting the uh, muscle atonia uh, that that seems to be a like a good indication that they may experience similar things during their sleep um, and yeah in that case in case of the uh, octopus because they for example with this changing of the bodily patterns you don't need to like they do that naturally and uh, they you don't need to kind of do a lesion to to actually um yeah to to allow them to to have this kind of muscle activity or or change in their body in relation to um what they have experienced before for example or, or what they can potentially experience during their dreaming it is a it's a useful model or that is my understanding oh, yes thank you i uh, to be honest, I could not understand why you know the octopus is a better model than other animals. So I asked that question, but I don't think it's you know the very important thing. So I'm just fine. Yeah. Yeah, do you actually do you have any questions about yeah. the paper? So I, I'm so interested in the sleepwalking. And uh, people who have sleepwalking did uh, not only the walking, but also a lot of things. So, and in this in this paper, or as far as I know, people can drive with sleepwalking, and it it is so busy, but busy. And I I'm wondering what is different difference between the, sorry, what the conscious difference between the uh, people walking and people sleepwalking. Also, I think they, they, they can perceive the world, but they don't have consciousness. And what is different, the, like the NCC or something, I'm wondering. 
Yeah, so I think this is, um, I don't think they, they address this in the paper, but uh, yeah, maybe we can continue with the discussion at this point. So my personal opinion and my personal experience, because I, I do have some experience with uh, sleepwalking. Um, so my conscious experience, there's definitely conscious experience and can kind of remember, but it's like widely different. And I think one of the interesting thing is this ability to, um, to monitor yourself or monitor your thoughts and, and do this kind of self-referential uh, thing. Um, like, and yeah, so the authors also discuss this idea uh, of the primary consciousness and the secondary consciousness, and they kind of bring, bring up this uh, distinction uh, between being conscious of your own environment and, and kind of processing some kind of information there. And also as a secondary type of consciousness, being able to, to do like self-referential thinking about your conscious experience. Um, so in that way, potentially um, sleepwalking can be, can be a part or, or can be a, um, a representation of uh, this kind of primary consciousness or like more of like just uh, very minimal sensory information processing, but less integration or uh, I guess kind of less or less than the ability to, to either memorize it and, but also to kind of evaluate it or, or process it on, on like, I don't know, deeper level. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's difficult because what those things mean, actually. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, so, the sleepwalking patients don't have the, like, the self-monitoring or self-consciousness and the metacognition or something, but, yeah, I see. Driving a car is is more complex, I think. Mm. So they they have to evaluate the signature or the uh, the number of the like the driving information. So yes, it is so interesting, and the and. Also, the like the, mm, the study of expert ex, expertism, the driving a car is complex, but this is more automate. This this process will be automated if easily or mm, after practice. So, I think they are interesting. If they are related, the automating process and so. Uh, if people have the action as automating process, they can do this with uh, sleep working or something. Mm. I think. Yeah, and I think the the interesting question is whether the conscious experience of someone who is sleepwalking is comparable, like. So yeah, so the authors in the beginning of the paper very much address that they kind of disregard the heart problem of consciousness discussion. Um, but I think it, it kind of, it is interesting to think about whether, um, you know, your ability to think about your, your experience and, and kind of, yeah, kind of try to, try to, analyze it or, or try to talk about it. Is that an important aspect? Or of course, that seems like an important aspect. And I guess in sleepwalking and in kind of this kind of sleep um, parasomnias, you, you may not have that kind of ability. Um, in that way, I think it's quite interesting. Yeah, like you said, metacognition or 
um, yeah, this kind of self-referential um, awareness or ability, how, how is that necessary for consciousness or um, whether it makes sense to define consciousness as it is necessary to it? I don't know. So I have a question about sleep walking. So first question is that does uh, sleep walking always accompany with conscious experiences? Because as far as I know, or this is just uh, my experience back in my uh, childhood, I know that I did sleep walking a lot not because I was aware of it, but I was told by my mom that, oh, what happened during the night? You were walking. But yeah, I, again, this is just my personal experience, uh, but I have never experienced anything dry, uh, during street walking. So, that's my question. Uh, does street walking always accompany with conscious experiences? Yeah, so I think this is a very difficult question and it kind of comes back to this uh, issue of whether, and yeah, the authors also discussed this in the beginning, what is dreaming and how can you define dreaming? And it is in most cases very strongly related to whether you can recall it. And again, um, so for me, like my sleepwalking experiences actually happened when I was an adult or like older. So, and also often I was waking up during it. So at that point you kind of like, uh, uh, yeah, I may, I may be wrong. So it is very difficult to know whether you had a conscious experience during sleepwalking or while I was in the process of waking up, I had a conscious experience. And that is what I kind of um, project to the sleepwalking. Um, and yeah, this is, again, so this is something that we could only, if we can answer, that would be, we would necessarily need some kind of neural uh, recording to actually see whether uh, the subjective reports can be correlated with kind of some kind of change in the activity. And if that activity change actually uh, is presented right after awakening or during the whole process. and yeah, I think in, in, in many cases, this is like, I don't think that many studies have been done on, on um, yeah, on this. And yeah, we definitely need to do more and, and kind of clarify this because, yeah, I, I don't know actually. And uh, yeah, I don't recall if the authors actually, the authors, I think, discuss that many people at least once in their life, so there's a high prevalence of sleepwalking or sleep talking or these kind of experiences. Uh, but I don't think they address whether there's a specific type of conscious experience during it. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, another question is that, well, like sleep driving, I have never heard of that. So I was a bit surprised, but is it only happen for those who are expert in like a drive, let's say the taxi driver or F1 racer or something, or just like everyone? Because I don't think I can drive a car during sleep because even, yeah, I'm awake, I'm fully awake, it's very difficult for me to drive a car. So it's really surprising. So as far as I know, I think it was more of a case study or like it's maybe a few unique cases. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's a general thing that can happen to everyone. Um, I think in most cases, like a large percentage of sleepwalkings are just general, like maybe a short walks during in their house or like I think it's very rare for people to actually leave their uh, home but I don't know actually the exact data about 
the percentages of these instances, but I, I reckon it, it cannot be very high. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question which is not related to sleepwalking. Um, the question or probably one possible like approach to answer animal sleep which might not be uh, written in this paper, and that is the decoding of dream. It's probably kind of related to, you know, the neural correlates of dreaming, but, you know, even you, even, you know, without knowing the underlying mechanism of sleep with, you know, machine learning, techniques or deep learning techniques, you can somehow decode the content of dream from um, non-human animals as well. And if we can show like some results saying um, even in sleep stage from non-human animal, some visual information can be, you know, extracted. Then probably we can say that all oh, this is because the animal had a dream of that content. So what what do you think about this? Yeah. So I think uh, again, I don't think I, I mentioned or, or discussed this um, in the summary, but uh, the author summarized a couple of interesting results about. Um, the fact that in humans, it seems that um, there are certain brain regions that can be identified uh, and their activity seem to be present when there's a, a dream report that kind of, so for example, maybe it's, it's easier to explain it with an example. Um, so the authors bring up uh, the activation in the fusiform face area when there's a clear perception of face in the dream or activation in the um, like the regions that are related to place perception or um, when, when there's, there's a clear spatial aspect uh, of the dream. And yeah, so I guess in, in that way, I think it's definitely possible to, um, to kind of find signatures of, of different um, different type of, of activities. Again, it might be more easy for, uh, for example, kind of more localized concepts such as a face or such as a place or like movement or something like that. Um, yeah, I think in, in any case, we can always look at these kind of signatures, but yeah, the difficult thing is to show um, their presence in, in the actual content of consciousness. But I guess in, in, in one, one way it could be, you know, the fact that humans seem to report dream content in relation to the specific features or the specific aspect, um, like faces or places, um, that, that seem to indicate that it might be the case. I think, uh, thank you. I have one other question, but if you have any question, you can ask first. For me, um, I, I don't have any question, but there, sorry, the last section, last, last talking about the sleepwalking, I sorry I I'm so interested in this so, but I think there have been cases where people have killed people in their sleepwalking, but they were innocent because sleepwalking is not the uh, will of the will of uh, them. So, and I think the like the sleepwalking mother and the sleepwalking drive is is so bizarre and it's so uh, 
not to not not know much so uh, we know them the uh, case but i think also the proportion of this event was so uh, small yeah so yeah so with that comment yeah no i think it's definitely yeah it's it's very interesting and but it also kind of shows that um i guess like there is quite high variability individual variability in sleep behaviors and and like there's a, a pretty pretty like large scale of of different um experiences and and uh how someone's brain works during dreaming so um yeah in that way i think this is quite difficult because uh, i'm not sure how like how easy it is to find really general rules um yeah but i think so maybe if we um we can also uh, mention some of the ongoing works in uh, in the lab. So William is working on the Dreamcatcher project, which is basically trying to find the neural signatures of uh, dreaming with large data, or like this kind of big data approach, which is, I think, a very very exciting and very like I'm, I'm very curious to see what what that project will actually find because I think so many of the um so i think definitely it will definitely be interesting and um useful to aggregate a lot of data on on sleep and dreaming and see how reliable certain measures are across a lot of uh, like across many people So can, can I ask one another question, which probably are uh, not related to this, you know, dream re research. But um, I know there are some species, uh, fish species, that can't stop swimming. Right. And first, you know, the question is that uh, do they sleep or not? That's first question, but if they sleep, but the you know the behavior will be the similar when comparing with uh, the awake stage and you know non dreams stage. So it's a bit difficult, I'd say, to infer the content of you know uh, dreaming on you know that kind of species so their approach can be applicable to some species but not to the other species probably i don't know because you know i know you know i'm not the expert of fish so oh this is my you know just an amateur knowledge but the let's say tuna they just swim after they give rise to birth. So th they just can't stop swimming. So I was yeah curious whether they have sleep stage. And if they have sleep stage, do they have a dream? And if they have a dream, it's not easy to infer their content of dream because um, based on behavioral, you know, patterns or behavioral observation, because it seems like they, their behavior are just the same across all different stages. But, you know, this is just, um, I don't know, comments or just a thought. Mm. Uh, so yeah, so actually they um, the authors mentioned this in the third section in the two sleep signatures 
across animal taxa. And they actually like just quickly mention uh, that fishes or fish do sleep and they seem to have uh, also this kind of um, two sleep uh, signatures of low and high activity sleep. Um, but then they also mentioned that apparently zebra fishes uh, don't have um, like rapid eye movements uh, during sleep. Um, and yeah, so I guess it's, it's uh, like, it's definitely different. Um, yeah, but they do sleep. And I think you, you can also see like some kind of uh, decrease in, in movement. And, you know, for example, in, a, uh, in case of fishes, may, they may be swimming, you know, um, just very slowly or, yeah. So I can imagine that um, that kind of shift in their behavior uh, and like less use of muscle, um, that can be considered as a as their um, version of sleep. So while listening to you, I started to feel like, okay, some species seems to have dream, but others do not. So the question is why we have dream? It's not easy to answer this, I understand. I'm just curious why we dream. Do you have any ideas or just anything is fine, but. So I think there's a lot of interesting discussion about this and um, many people have proposed uh, slightly different versions of the same idea of like dreaming being um, some kind of vague to simulate potential uh, outcomes and potential environmental conditions. Um, I think quite recently, Eric Hoel, he, he published a paper on this kind of uh, idea of dreams are actually able to kind of expand our um, potential uh, kind of reactions, or I don't know, I don't want to misrepresent his, um, his idea but yeah so basically during dreaming your brain can train or can kind of um, practice a wide range of potential actions and and responses from the environment and and you know maybe a potential aspect of like this kind of surreality or or weirdness of the dream is is can be explained or can be um well, yeah, so it, it can be part of the fact that it's quite useful to have a, you know, so-called training set that is very wide and, and, and can encompass a lot of different conditions and options and environmental uh, situations. And, um, you know, your dreams, the fact that your dreams can be, you know, very normal, but also very like strange that this kind of indicates that, uh, or that can, can be interpreted as a potential for, yeah, like your brain is trying to solve or trying to resolve many different situations that could potentially arise. Um, or at least that is, that is I think, uh, for me, a very attractive or very interesting um, theory and um, yeah, like explanation, but. I don't know what the how 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 can we well um, examine or or kind of falsify this claim. Um, probably one possible approach is that thinking about how many like actions they can take, because if you can take only one actions, you don't need to do simulation, right? And again, in the case of fish, tuna, what they can do is just swim in this direction, this direction, and that direction, and that's it, right? So in that sense, maybe tuna do not have dream because they don't need to do the simulation, probably. But yeah, I don't know. 
I can kind of see, but I think also it's, you know, for example, like for a fish evaluating its environment and potential like predators or um, like, I think that could be a reason to, to dream because, you know, maybe they would need some kind of simulation of like, yeah, maybe their potential action is like, yeah, if I swim that way or not, or um, uh, I swim a certain direction, but then I think they might need some uh, way of deciding whether swim that way or this way, depending on their environment and depending potential threats and, you know, the responses of other fish uh, around them. So I guess it's, I guess it's, so this is the difficult aspect of this kind of explanation is that you can make up narratives quite easily about why something would need dreaming, but I'm, I, yeah, whether it is right or not, that's the question. Yeah, so, yeah, I did not consider the you know, possibility of input, but given that, let's say if we, I don't know whether they are such kind of animal or not, but let's say if they are animal that can receive only limited amount of input, and then at the same time, they can have a limited possibility of their actions, let's say just a one-to-one -one map, like one input, receive one input and do one output. If that's the case, then I don't think that kind of animals don't need to uh, have a simulation function. But, you know, again, this is kind of theoretical or just an imaginary thing. So I don't know whether it's possible or not, but yeah. Spirit to you. Oh, yeah, you can say something. Yeah. Well, I I have three ideas of functional dream, and I think one is the same as I got a simulation, and especially for human simulation of the so, so social simulation for with people, and uh, secondly, I and the, as they also mentioned the deactivation of the more vivid memory or something. And third one, I think the uh, like the compensate function of the perception brain uh, activity. So I think the so the dreaming is right like the hallucination or uh, illusion or something quick quick and uh, for example, the Charbonne syndrome of the Oliver Sacks and the elderly people with uh, bright sight, uh, they see the hallucination. And also, the same with the uh, right heart, the people who didn't hear, but with the older, older age, but they, they hear the something, illusion. This means that the brain activated, but input is nothing. So, so compensate the brain activity or brain uh, processing information. So, and also in the sleeping, we also don't have the information input. So, in dreaming, is the like the compensation function. In, not input, but brain activate, brain will be activated. So the dream is like the, I'd say, the illusion or hallucination to uh, remain the brain activate, activation uh, performance or something. I know. Yeah, and I think that's a very good point to bring up that indeed we, um, yeah, it's it's very difficult to to kind of draw up the the process or the causality structure here because um, indeed it can be that dreaming has a function or it's likely that it has a function, but it's also possible that 
your brain activity just kind of accidentally or or in a way create some kind of um, subjective experience mm, or maybe in case of some dreams it's just yeah just a random set of activation that kind of occurs and uh, it's not necessarily yeah like I I, I, I am very um, kind of sympathetic to this idea of not all dreams necessarily have the same like the same features or the same characteristics and maybe some dreams are more like this kind of simulation like thing but maybe other dreams are just like you said random activity that occurs in the brain and um yeah maybe it's just not really well structured but it's more just a set of i don't know different qualia or different percepts that are happening at the same time and and um yeah it's it's not necessarily for to achieve something or, or in order to do something. Okay, I think we've already discussed for roughly one hour. So if you do not have anything to say, maybe we can finish now. I guess for me, just one more thing. Um, so I was wondering about um, again, the, the role of other uh, theories of consciousness and um, whether, so the authors bring up uh, this posterior hot zone that is kind of related to IIT, um, but I think it's mostly because, uh, yeah, like I think Tononi has been working with sleep quite a lot. So of course he has a lot of you know, relevant uh, papers and, and discussion about sleep as well. Um, but yeah, so I'm I'm wondering uh, what are like. Do you know if other theories of consciousness, such as the global neural workspace or higher order thought theory, or um, like other theories of consciousness, address sleeping or dreaming in any way? I, I can't really think of uh, good examples, but that is most likely because yeah, I just don't know enough papers. But I was wondering if you know of any any good examples. Uh, first of all, I have never encountered any you know research or study um, about the relation between sleep and theories of consciousness, like a high order theory and global New York space theory and recurrent processes and things like that. Mm, probably we can somehow explain you know dream content of dream by any theories of consciousness probably because i mean in the case of higher order theory what they claim is that you know they are one kind of brain region or something that represent or mental states so higher order representation of you know the first order representation and as long as that kind of you know structure higher order versus uh first order uh, within the you know dream dream stage we can somehow infer okay then um let's say in the case of the dream with face perception and um, let's say an um, activation first we observe the activation in ffa and then in some region brain the activity is re-represented and um, if we can find that kind of you know situation then according to high order theory it should be in the content of consciousness and um, probably you know we can do something like that for any other theories but i am well i don't know whether it's explicitly like you know stated in any papers or not Ryoichi probably no yeah sorry i don't detail i don't know the detail but i think the global neural workspace theory explains that the dream effect like the content of 
content of dream is like a global ignition and uh, on the global space. So, so that's okay. And I see uh, that HOT hot uh, higher order theory also. First order content is good, the dream content of dream. And, and higher order is in a uh, need for like the metacognition or self monitoring or self uh, representation. So this criteria is called the dream as consciousness. But how about lucid dream? Uh, in the lucid dream, the agents know this is a dream and they know uh, they perceive the content. So I, I don't know, but this case uh, will be past the uh, um, higher order theory or something, I think. Yeah, no, that's a very good, that's a very good example and a good question. I, I don't know how, or yeah, it, it's an interesting question. How would a higher order a sort of theory kind of explained lucid dreaming? Or like how it is different from wakefulness because I mean yeah it should be I, I guess yeah it depends on but I I would think it would be useful for any theory of consciousness to actually be able to differentiate between lucid dreaming and wakefulness. Um, But it's quite difficult because technically in lucid dreaming, you will have a perception of your environment. Of course, this is like a dream environment that your brain created, but you are kind of, you have your self-awareness and you can manipulate this. So yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So if you don't have anything to say, we will finish now. Um, no? Okay, then uh, see you next week. Bye-bye.